Amy Oxley is the Director of Evidence and Forensic Services, Jackson, Tennessee Police Department. Uh, I've known Amy for years. Uh, she used to do training with us all over the southeast and I guess the country. Uh, does an excellent job. She's certified. What, there's some certification you've got, Amy, that so, well, more than one, but uh, <laughs> what, what, all the certifications, what certifications Well, my, my certification was until 2020 through the International Association for Identification. I was a certified senior crime scene analyst. Um, like I said, I, I held that certification for 10 years and I allowed it to, to lapse in 2020. But, but there, isn't, isn't there one certification you have that's, that's kind of rare? rare that, that was it. That was um, it. Actually, we now have two that are certified at J have been certified at JPD with that same. Um, one of our investigators just passed his his uh, certified crime scene analyst um, oh, certification program. So. Congratulations, him. Yeah. So you, what got you started in the in the police business? Amy? Oh my goodness. Um. So beyond my wildest dreams, I never thought that I would work in law enforcement or forensics or deal with deal with evidence or work crime scene or latent fingerprints. But um, I was a senior in high school. I'd been working for the Kroger Company for several years. And a captain, Captain Richard Higgins, came through my line at Kroger one day, and um, I worked in the office also, and I just happened to be on the line that day, and he said, we need somebody like you at the police department. Put in your application. Well, he was over the central records division, and that's where, that's where he wanted me, so I didn't have any plans after high school, and went ahead and put in my application when I was 18, and I was hired um, a month after I turned 19. So... You were you you were 19, 18, 19? I was I was nineteen when I was your first job. Mm -hmm. Well, you said you were working at the. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. Ever ever wished it back? Oh no, <laughs> no. Uh, like I said, I've often wondered how I wound up. You know, it's just not what I saw or envisioned for myself. But uh, I've I've had a, a great career, and the city's been good to me, and the police department's been good to me, and I've had uh, great mentors and supervisors um, through the years, and uh, it's. It's made me who I am today, and I'm, I'm glad I stuck with it. I'm glad I'm there. I've been really blessed in my career. You've done very well. I understand Jackson Police Department may be in a hiring situation now. Is that correct? Oh, we're always hiring. I think we've got a few civilian positions that, that are opened or are opening soon. I know citywide there are multiple positions that are open. Uh, always hiring police officers. So over 21, clean background check. Um, certified officers or you know that are looking for a change of pace or a larger agency always encouraged to go ahead and apply okay by certified officers we're talking about officers that have been through the academy right? correct and our post police officer standards and training commission uh certified right correct okay good uh decent pay benefits oh yeah i mean i think that's the to me that's the the biggest thing is the the benefits and um, i've heard so many people that have worked in factories or um other private facilities that you know your your time off isn't all that great well city of jackson you get 10 hours of sick leave every month 10 hours of vacation leave every month 13 paid holidays so i mean you have you have a lot of time that you can bank up to take off so you get those vacations um and uh, the benefit package as far as uh, medical, dental, vision insurance, you have the option to buy in on uh, disability insurance. So you have a lot of options. And it, and, and it can be a rewarding job. It can be very frustrating. But, you know, to me, the big thing about being a, a really fine police officer is compassion. I, I spoke at Sheriff Bill Kelly's funeral a couple of years ago down in Somerville, and, and he'd been sheriff for 30-something years. When he left, he was... Uh, the longest serving sheriff in the history of Tennessee and I was honored to speak at his funeral and and I said you know Bill had the had the skills he had the knowledge to be a good officer but his compassion for other human beings is what made him a great officer oh I would agree with that yeah and that's what makes the job really rewarding mm -hmm. uh, you know we got a, we got a big case going right now and I know how busy you stay get to work like old dark 30 and stay there till, till you get through uh big cases have been going on in the news and i know you hadn't been able to keep up with it much had the four college students killed up in moscow uh idaho and as we're we're speaking they, they, there's a guy under arrest uh, a lot of it is uh, 
apparently going to go back, or at least some of the case. Seems as though it's going to go back to DNA testing. Well, folks who don't, let's just play like people don't know anything about DNA testing at all. Can you kind of give them a, a little primer on, on what DNA testing really is, what it does, what it means? Well, I mean, um, er, everyone has DNA. DNA is the building block of, of anything and everything, plants, humans, anything. Um, so there's multiple ways that DNA can be extracted from an item with, with humans. It would be um, a swab inside your cheek. Um, so you could take that and test it and extract a DNA profile for that individual. Obviously blood, um, other okay, bodily a, a, fluids. A profile means uh, it describes that sample or, or what? That's that? correct. It, it um, yeah, it, it gives markers, and those markers can match up to an unknown sample. So if you have a known sample, and you can see those the markers on it, then you get the the unknown, and you can compare the two. Okay. If you and I went to a crime scene, like the one we're talking about up there, it was four people uh, killed with knife. If we went in there and, and we're working together, and I'm an investigator and you're walking out as a forensic investigator, what would we be looking for? What, what, ty what kind of places might we find uh, DNA evidence in a crime scene like that, you think? Well, I mean, there would be, depending on, you know, how large of an area it is and things like that, you would, you would look for blood that would be out of place. Um, so if you had a victim who was in a pool of blood but then you see a blood trail that's like leaving out the door. That blood trail may indicate, especially with with a knife, a, a perpetrated crime, that the suspect may have cut themselves. Right. You know, once you stab something or your hands are sweaty, their hand could have slipped and they could have cut themselves. And you know that you would want to look for that those blood spots going in an area that that's not where your victim is because that may be the, the suspect's blood so you would want to swab that and get a sample of that um uh, anything yeah. anything out of place anything that looks like it may not have belonged to the victim you know a, a coat that's thrown down on the ground and it's all females that are in the house and it's a male's coat something like that you know those those items are things that you would want to go ahead and collect just to see if they could be analyzed for dna and a profile made can you let's say let's say we've got a pool of blood lying in the floor and some of it is a victim and some of it may be the assailant's blood can you separate can you take a sample from that pool of blood and can can the, can the testing people separate that or, or have you ever? i believe now i'm not a forensic scientist um so i don't work for for a forensic laboratory uh or a serologist um but my understanding is if it's especially if it's male and female that's pretty easy to separate those two profiles because of the genetic background between okay. the chromosomes hadn't thought about um, that um but it's my understanding that once you have same sex dna once you get over two people it's difficult to separate those so if you have multiple multiple contributors okay. it may be more difficult to develop well, enough DNA to develop a profile that for make sense, those it? people. But you think with two people, they can, that's fairly workable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, especially when it's male and female. You know, you can fool with this stuff so much. And I know I've been fooled with crime scenes, and I'm sure you have too. But I, when you were talking about a trail, I uh, worked, a, worked a, a killing in a town here in West Tennessee. And, and I, matter of fact, I spoke about it on the radio before. Uh, it was over drugs, a Dilaudid, uh, argument over some Dilaudid pills. And terrible crime scene. I mean, it was bad. We got to, one of the few times I ever got the people from the crime lab in Nashville to come down. I was working for the TBI then. Got them to come down and work. They came down for this one. And we had a tremendous amount of blood. And then we had a trail of blood going to the bathroom. And a lot of blood in the sink, some in the bathtub, you know, which appeared to be obvious that the killer was trying to clean up before they left. So, and this is a lot of blood, ain't it? And so we start questioning people, and, and, and there were several of us, I think there were like four of us up there working, at, at, and there weren't that many. That was a lot for us to have them. Okay. And uh, plus, you know, PD was working on Sheriff's Office working on Anyway, we interviewed like 60 people in two days or something. 
and we were looking for somebody that was cut one of the things we were even having men take their shirts off that kind of stuff couldn't find anybody one of the crime scene guys that had come down i think it was bob mcfadden but i'm not sure one of the fingerprint guys and he called me one day to check on you know how you coming along i said well i said we we can't find anybody that's been cut and he said well what about old mike so-and-so i said he wasn't cut we looked at him made him take it i said i talked to him myself made him take his shirt off he said his right index finger was cut i said what he said i just looked at his fingerprint card this morning and his right fingerprint right right index finger he's got a cut on him and i looked you know he sent it to me whatever and it was like a paper cut small cut and it had put out a whole lot of blood we were totally off base on what we were looking at. And it turned mm-hmm. out this guy was the killer. Oh, wow. Yeah, but it, uh, and, and, and I'm sure you're a lot better at reading crime scenes than I ever was. I wasn't afraid of it, but, but sometimes you can get thrown off with things like that. No. Yeah, I'm sure you can. But, you know, the, the, the way that you approach any case is different than the way I approach a case because I don't deal with suspects. I don't deal with interviews. I, you know, I... I'm out of that so I have a singular focus that's inside that scene and collecting as much evidence in as pristine a condition as possible to make sure that you can do your job and interview and prosecute the suspect so so it's just different mindsets well it is and and it's good that it's that way that's that's the way we need to be thinking Mm -hmm. Uh, you know uh, we used to teach and Dennis and I used to teach and you had part of this course I'm pretty sure I'm sure you did we taught we called it uh, uh, working a case for trial and we emphasize that from the time you get the first phone call, you have to be, you have to have courtroom presentation in your mind. If you mess yours up, Amy, and don't collect that evidence properly, we can't get it in court, can we? That's right. That's so right. What's, so it's not really, probably not worth anything to us. Mm-hmm. Could be, but probably not. And, and, uh, and, you know, a lot of times, you know, I think people, we're in the DNA age, I guess, and people... It used to be fingerprints. Now it's DNA. I think once they hear that that you've got DNA, or that you got fingerprints, they think, well, that's it. That's the case. Is that necessarily so? No, it's not. You've got to have more than just. I think we talked about it in in the last show that we talked. And um, you've got to have more than just a fingerprint. You've got to have more than just DNA. So for an investigator, that would just give them that would give them a huge lead. And then they would need to put boots to the ground and do some some more work, uh, find witnesses. Um, you know, this day and age, I look at how much investigators have access to that. Back when you were on the streets, you didn't. You know, you were knock. You were literally knocking on people's doors sure. and trying to find out who that person's friend group was, and then spread out from there. Well, now, you know, investigators have digital tools and um, people are all over Facebook and posting things that they did and where they were and where they've been and things like that. So um, there's just a wealth of electronic information um, that's available now that wasn't even available back when oh, yes. when you were pictures. in your heyday. Pictures, cameras up, taking pictures of Oh, right, you know. right. Yeah, street cameras and surveillance just outside of bi- businesses, yeah. ring door cameras. You know, I think the police department has um, a program where people can anonymously send in if, if they know that an incident yeah. happened in, in their area and their doorbell camera or their security cameras happen to catch anything, that they can submit those. Yeah. Um, great. So. Right. And I'm going to say this, and I'm not saying it's just because that you work there or any of that at all. We've got a progressive police department here. Oh, I, I agree. We yeah, really we do. really do. Yeah, mm-hmm. And I'm very proud of what they do. Uh, um, you make me think so. Folks, you did. You just heard a good example of how she talks down to me. See, when she said, well, remember we talked about it on the last show. See, she knows how old I am. <laughs> she, I can't remember the last show. She, said, she does that all the time. But uh, what? That was something you brought up. You can't just have DNA and you can't just have fingerprints. You got to have more than that. Yeah, we so used to say we used to say that you had to take your investigation to give meaning to the circumstantial evidence. Give meaning to it. Exactly. You know, and yeah. I've used the example a thousand times. And I, you, you and I, if if I came to see your office today and you had your your laptop sitting on your desk, I might well touch your laptop, and it might get stolen, you know, that afternoon. 
and they might get my DNA off your laptop but I didn't steal it mm -hmm. or my fingerprint either you know but so you gotta it's gotta you gotta give, give meaning to it they uh which was what I was waiting to see in, in the big killing up in, in, in Utah you know they kept saying we got we've done the, the familial genealogy thing or family tree you know what they call it. and what I was I said well let's hear where they got the DNA sample from there's a lot of difference, and, and I heard them say that they, they put, of course, they put gloves and bags or whatever around the finger, hands of the victims. And I was wondering, I was thinking about the difference in getting DNA sample from those victims' fingerprints and from a piece of furniture mm -hmm. in the house, we'll say. Mm -hmm. uh, right, so if, if you have a victim that has a suspect's skin cells underneath their fingernails, that's going to mean a lot more than finding a suspect's DNA or fingerprints somewhere else just in the house or in, you know, when it's actually on the victim or defensively underneath a victim's fingernails, that's going to, that's going to mean a lot more. That's going to be a bigger piece of right. the puzzle. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, can, if I touch you, let's say touch you on your arm. Is that touch DNA? Can they get my DNA from just from me touching you on your Well, own? pretty much any, you're constantly set, shedding skin cells and, you know, perspiring and everything. So you're, anything that you touch, you're going to leave a trace of yourself. You're going to leave a trace of your fingerprint. Is it going to be a, a fingerprint that would be viable enough to make an identification? Maybe, maybe not. You're going to leave DNA everywhere you go. Is it going to be enough to develop a profile? Maybe, maybe not. But you're you're constantly just just by you sitting right there in that chair and by breathing on that microphone, you know, you're you're putting your DNA there. So it's it's there. The investigator or the the crime scene tech just has to has to collect it, and it has to be enough for the forensic scientist to develop a profile on. Yeah, interesting. interesting. Have you ever ever worked much with with uh, blood spatters not much um paulette sutton right. i went to her course just a quick course crash course years ago um super interesting mm. um i don't think i have the mathematical mind to uh to triangulate and find the the point of impact and all those things that they do but i know a little bit about blood spatter itself enough that if i'm in a scene and I see blood, I can tell whether it's a trail or whether the person was standing still when the, the blood was dropped, things like that, just by the shape and size of the the blood drops. On a gunshot wound, let's say, could, could you maybe tell the direction that the bullet came from? So on any, any blood spatter or any blood spot, um, the sharper the spot, so if you have a, a teardropped shape blood spatter you're going to know that there's there's force behind that if you have something that's um sh just a dot or a round circle straight you're going to know that that came from a 90 degree angle so let's say the, the person that you were talking about that had cut their finger if he just stood in the hallway with his hand beside his side and that blood dropped straight down to a hardwood floor you're going to have a circle pattern it's just going to be one dot right but if um Let's say if somebody swung a bat and hit someone, that blood is going to have a tail to the end of it, and the tail points to the direction of travel. The, the tail would be pointing at the direction they came from? Is the, that right? Or? That, that would be the direction that the blood is going. going. So, okay. so a, let's just say a drop of blood would hit a surface at with force because you somebody hit you with a bat. So the cast off from that blood is going to hit a surface and it's going to make a bubble, and then that bubble is going to break into that tail, and that tail shows which way it's going. So the force is continuing okay. off towards the tail. Okay, makes sense. Folks, we're talking to Miss Amy Oxley, the Director of Evidence and Forensic Services, Jackson, Tennessee Police Department, an absolute expert in this line of work. Um, I asked you once, and I sent you, a, and 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 uh, this is on the, the book you're helping me with. One of the questions. And I know you get tired of me sending you questions all the time, but when I when I think of them, I need to send them because, as you pointed out, I won't remember. <laughs> uh, 
if a person is suffering at some level of anxiety, as in pulling the trigger on a, on, on a sniper rifle or something, and they're not and they're not used to doing that, something out of the ordinary for them, uh, and, and they're not doing it in a wartime situation, they're doing a civilian situation where they're, 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 uh, there's a chance of arrest and, and losing their you know, right to live or whatever. And, and they've got a lot of anxiety going on. Maybe have a little perspiration because of the stress and the anxiety. How would that affect fingerprints that might be left on that firearm that they're using? Positively and negatively. Um, so the, the more moisture an individual has on their hands, so the more that they perspire or the more um, oils that they exude from the pores on their fingers, the more likely you're gonna get a usable fingerprint. In the case of somebody perspiring a lot, that could kind of uh, obscure the print a little bit because it would smear it or smudge Sm it. Yeah. Um, but I would rather have somebody sweating than not if I was going to be if I was going to be processing something um, for mm -hmm. for fingerprints. Would it have any any impact at all on the duration? How long that fingerprint would, would so last, would show up whatever. So that's interesting. Um, I remember a course that I took years and years ago, and uh, the the latent examiner was talking about how difficult it is to recover latents. And I don't know if this has been disproven, but to me it just makes sense in my head. Um, to recover latents on younger children, um, say a seven-year-old kidnap victim that's in the back of a car and touches the window on a hot summer day. So the child may have left um, enough fingerprint residue to develop a print, but the longer that print stays there, because it's sweat, it's going to evaporate, so to say. Once a person reaches puberty, you start other pituitary glands and things like that are working overtime, so there's more of the, the oils, the sebaceous type glands that are ex excreting, and those prints have more of a staying power than just a sweaty print. If it's just all amino acids, it's gonna evaporate quicker and break up and just kind of be, the, the, the lines and the ridge detail are gonna be a bit more spotty than it is when you have those lipidy type fatty prints that have the, the lipids in them as well as the amino acids. Interesting, That's interesting. I had never thought about that really until just a short time ago. You know, you sent me some stuff, you gave me some stuff, uh, and I remember it, I read it, I remember it, uh, about, about fraudulent fingerprints. Mm -hmm. Have you dealt with many cases where, where there were fraudulent, or, or explain what, what I'm saying fraudulent, would you let people so know what I'm talking about? So there are, um, there are some people, and it's, it's almost like Hollywood in a way, um, you, would, you would like to think that it doesn't happen, but uh, apparently it happens and has happened a lot more than I was even aware of before I took this recent course um, where individuals will take the opportunity to see someone maybe pick up you just picked up your drinking glass and I'm sure you left a, a decent print on that glass right then well when you're not looking if I was wanting to fabricate your print and put it somewhere I could take a piece of lift tape, lift that off the side of that glass while you weren't watching, and then I could take that print and apply it somewhere else and assign it, to, you know, to a case number, put a case number on it. Okay, when you say apply it to somewhere else, would you kind of explain? So you could actually lift that print off of the side of your glass, and maybe I know of a case where a glass was left at a crime scene, and I wanted to... You know, because, you know, we're 007 here. We're going to be Jason Bourne. <laughs> I'm going to plant your fingerprint on another glass that I know is inside this crime scene. So I would just take that same piece of tape and apply it to that other glass, peel it off, and there's going to be enough residue still left on that piece of tape to to put that your print on this glass that you've never even been around and you've never touched. Well, you mentioned the James Bond kind of thing. But what, to do what you just described, would you have to be terribly... Uh, uh, sophisticated to do that? Sadly, no. I mean, if you if you knew what to do, I think you know any anybody could do it. 
But a good fingerprint examiner might pick that up too. Might. The fingerprint examiner should pick that up. Yeah, <laughs> we've only had since I've been at the PD, and it wasn't it wasn't me who caught it. Um, it was our senior latent examiner, William Roan, who I remember when it happened. Yeah, if it's the same case I'm <laughs> yeah. thinking about. Yeah. Who retired? He retired um, in 2020, and actually he just turned uh, 89 in December of a legendary person. Yeah, in, in December kind of, of work, 22. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's pretty amazing. But um, he had another agency bring in a fingerprint card um, the individual told him that he had dusted a car for fingerprints and had lifted this fingerprint off of the trunk of this car and he applied that dusted and lifted fingerprint to a fingerprint card put a case number on it put an incident or I'm sorry put a case number on it a date and time that he lifted it where he lifted it from and he brought it to Mr. Roan to look at um, Mr. Roan, having 60 some odd years of experience <laughs> in fingerprints, he looked at it and um, the individual just kept saying, I, I know this is this guy. So he, he brought the guy's arrest card with his fingerprints on it as well as that lifted fingerprint and said, I just need you to ID him. You know, I, I know it's this guy. Um, Mr. Roan said, okay, you know, just tell you what, leave it with me. Let, let me hold on to this. Um, as soon as I get my report written up, I'll call you and let you know. And he kind of, you know, showed him, basically showed him the door. And he went to our legal advisor at the time and said, look, I don't, I don't think this is a lifted fingerprint from, from this car. Um, it, it's too clean. There's no powder residue in the background of, of the, the tape. Um, and it doesn't really look like fingerprint powder. It almost looks like printer's ink, which is what at the time we used when a person was arrested and we rolled their fingerprints. Now yeah. it's all electronic. Um, anyway, long story short, the officer slash investigator from the other agency had used um, a tape lifter and pulled that individual's print off of his 10 print card there was just enough ink on that card that he was able to pull a clean print and put it on the, the temperant card and wound up admitting it. Of course, he said he was just testing us. He was just testing our department to, <laughs> to make sure that we knew what we were doing. He's no longer in police work. He's right? no longer yeah. in police work, yeah. He, does, he, he said he wasn't really fabricating that fingerprint. He wasn't trying to set anybody up. He was just doing yeah. a test. Yeah. But you know one thing? You just said something I hadn't even thought about in a long, but the last time that I had to get fingerprinted for uh, private investigator's license or something like that, some kind of certification I had to get, and uh, it was electronic instead of using that ink. And I thought, Golly, Bill, what would I have given? Because I used to hate to do that. Well, to, we did it to we roll did it them in ink. When I was a TV, I would do that mm -hmm. a lot. And uh, and we used to do what we call major case file prints. And that instead of just getting rolled impressions of the fingers, we'd get the sides of their hand and their palms. And and it took me about a week to do it. <laughs> And we were doing a bank robbery one time, and a guy that had robbed three bank robbed robbed the bank of uh, Inville. Is it Inville? Yeah, I think it's Inville down in Chester County. Robbed it three times. They finally closed it. Just said calf rope, shut it down. And he had just gotten out of prison and robbed the bank of Hornsby, and we were fortunate enough to catch him. So I was doing the the, the major case file prints. On, we were in the Hardman County Jail, and my. my my buddy, my you know, fellow TV agent, Tommy Lewis, was there with me. So, you know, on those cards, they had a little block. It wasn't big at all. And you put the Tennessee Code annotated number of the offense, the TCA number. Mm -hmm. Well, I couldn't remember those numbers. We had a car in a trunk, you know. So I said, Tommy, stay here with him. I'm going to go out and uh, get the book. I'd already done all the fingerprints now. And I came back in, and I looked, and he said, Harold Matlock was this guy's name bank robber and I looked and Harold Tommy said I don't know what Tommy he said well I didn't know what he did but he had taken my fingerprint cards and in the little block that I was fixing to fill in he wrote I ain't robbed no bank oh, no. I said Tommy <laughs> what did you and I did I did all the cards and, all that. And, and you know that kind of brings to mind a thing we were talking about a minute ago all the all the new technological advances we have from your work can you say what has been probably the the biggest advance the one that's most helpful um 
I mean, I, I, I think it would be the, the automated fingerprint identification system through FBI, which is a database of fingerprints that are computerized that used to just be hard copy fingerprint files. Um, that's That's been a huge advancement. Um, you know, we have the National Integrated Ballistics Identification Network uh, with JPD, which is a ballistics program. So it's a cataloged program of uh, shell casings that are entered into this database that can be searched against when, you know, we get casings from a crime scene or they test fire, one, someone in the Niven unit test fires uh, a gun that came into our evidence unit. Um, DNA, the, the CODIS database, the combined, what is it? You should know, combined. I should know. Yeah, combined DNA. Identification system. Something like that. <laughs> but it's, again, it's just a huge database of known DNA profiles that can be searched against. Um, things like that are amazing. The, the fact that, you know, 30 years ago, 30, 35 years ago, you had to have a spot of blood bigger than a quarter to develop a blood type. Blood type, yes. And now you can have, you know, picograms of DNA that you can't even see. It's invisible. It's touch DNA. You can't see it with your eye. And you can send it to a forensic scientist who can extract DNA and develop a profile. It's just amazing. It is, and and you know one thing that it, that has been pointed out by by some of the technological advances we have, that we knew, I mean, they, I remember when people used to think that if we got a picture of somebody, it was over. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't think you got to identify them, and you got to you got to really give that picture some meaning a lot of times, and this and that, and a lot of times the pictures weren't good, you know, uh, but now. You know, it seems like almost every crime that I saw, well, the ones they put on TV, I'm sure they pick the ones, you know, that are the best, make the best TV, be smart with it. Uh, but we got pictures of a lot of people, and we still can't get the crime solved. Right. You know, it's a long way from just having a picture. picture to identification. Yeah, and from identification sometimes to a, to a conviction. Right. Uh, but, you know, one thing that, that, that got me when I was working with the PD, we got to, we, we uh, solved a couple of, couple of murders, same guy committed both murders and one of those murders the body was out in youth park and he was on parole i guess parole or probation one had an ankle bracelet on mm -hmm. and in the initial investigation and i wouldn't even have thought of this you know but the investigators there of course did it and and they were able to with that ankle bracelet put put this guy within it was something crazy amy like within eight inches of the body uh, within 20 minutes of when the murder probably happened, you know, that kind of thing. And see, they can do that with cell phones now, too. You know, it's anything that, that can track your location. Yeah, it's, it's I think amazing. the cell phones are going to come into play with it. The, the case we were talking about earlier with the four college students. Oh, you think so? I think so, yeah, yeah. One of the articles that I've read said that. Folks, we're talking to, to uh, Amy Oxley, uh, Director of Evidence and uh, uh, Forensic Services here at Jackson Police Department. Very knowledgeable very good friend um, and you know one thing that that I, I have to of course as, as you have sort of pointed out without really pointing out I'm, I'm an old dog and uh, I wonder sometimes we rely a lot on technology now I wonder if some of the other skills may be kind of being put to the side it's funny you were saying that about hating to ink people for fingerprints and all I could think is how old am I that I actually prefer looking at 10 print cards that are inked instead of the pixelated ones that are the digital ones that they're doing now. I know it is. It's cleaner. It's cleaner to do it electronically, fingerprint somebody electronically, but man, those prints look so much prettier when it's the, the printer's ink. So it's well, kind of... Yeah. <laughs> they look a lot prettier than mine, so, I will guarantee you. So we're, we're both old heads. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to bring it up. <laughs> but you know, I think about... I know when I was... when I was Back when I was doing cold case, you know, I worked for Jackson PD and worked for a couple of Madison County and another sheriff's office too. And everybody was, was tuned into the, to the keyboard. Mm -hmm. and I remember one particular case, I, I was looking for someone because I would come in like when I was at the PD, I'd come in and read those those uh, activity reports coming out of CID. Now, I wouldn't be in there every day, but I didn't miss a day of those reports to see if there was anybody mentioned in there 
that I was interested in talking to. And uh, I was looking for a guy once, and I went to one of the detectives, and uh, I said, hey, I, I need to try to talk to this guy. And they turned around, and, looked, and they couldn't find anything good in the computer on this guy, like a recent address or anything like that. I said, okay, thanks. So I started going back through my little paper copy reports that I had. And uh, about two or three days later, I went to talk to the same detective. He was a very good detective, very good. And uh, I said, hey, I talked to so-and-so the other day. He said, you did? And I said, hey, so how'd you find him? I said, I went to see his mother. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, you can do things like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, I know, you know, the first book I wrote was on interviewing. I wrote some books in case you Right, I know, I have them. I actually, I think all of my copies are signed, so they're probably worth yeah, more. Well, who signed them? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I, I quote Bill Kelly, the sheriff I was just talking. And Bill had a saying. He said, you know, to solve these cases, he say, he called me Bo. He said, Bo, you got to make footprints. And I hope we don't lose sight of that aspect where we're, we're waiting on a DNA hit. Well, let the lab do the DNA work. Get out here and start yeah, don't. knocking on doors, you know, right. and people, looking at people. I don't know. That's my And letting people talk to you and encouraging them exactly. to talk to you, yeah. And you just yeah. made a great point. Uh, you know, it's really uh, listening is a whole lot more important than talking. I know what I know. Mm -hmm. What I need to try to find out. It's what you know. You know, good Lord gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. Right. You know, it's a little more important to listen. I agree. Than just to talk. But, yeah. uh, anyway. Uh, there was another thing. I, uh, bite marks. There was a case I was looking at the other day, not long ago. And bite marks were, were it sounded like going to be a significant part of the evidence in that case. Have you worked with bite marks any much? I've only had one case in all these years that, that I had a victim that was bitten, um, and she she was a homicide victim. Um, <clears throat> really, the, the only thing that can can be done, as far as I know, and, and what we did, is uh, photographing those bite marks under an alternate light source to, to make the marks show up on the skin better. Um, use an alternate light source at about 450 nanometers on the wavelength. I know that means a whole lot, but um, photograph it, and then we would have to send that elsewhere to a forensic odontologist to make a comparison. If you had a suspect and you had that suspect's dental records, then that dentist could compare the two. Um, from my standpoint, that my my biggest thing would be wanting to swab that bite mark off of that victim for the potential of developing a DNA profile yeah. on the, the suspect. You would not even consider uh, like a cast of any type or anything? I don't think that you could do a cast. That's it would have to be, thinking, yeah, yeah, it would have to yeah. be a, a deep impression. I mean, you, it would have to be a bite out of the skin to do any type of a cast, but most of the time it's, you know, most of the time it's bruising on the skin where the person's teeth dug into the person. It, most of the time, at least the one that I dealt with, the skin wasn't actually broken. Right. It was just you could really tell that they had taken a, a hard bite on that, that victim's, her upper arm. Yeah. Did you ever, I, I don't know when this may have stopped, or you may, I don't think you said it, plaster casts? Have you ever worked with plaster casts? Yes. Um, so that's mostly footwear impressions is, is what we use. Tire tracks, um, maybe? Tire, yeah, you can. You can cast a tire track. Um, yeah, and then you would also do the um if you got this the suspected the suspected vehicle you could take an impression of the tires themselves on just a long board kind of like poster board um and you could send that and a tire mark expert could look and do the comparison on that same thing with footwear you have footwear impression experts that can do that it's, i mean almost identical to the way that a latent fingerprint examiner would compare a known and unknown fingerprint to see if it's from the same source. I, I actually, I, I'm sure this won't surprise you to find out that I was not good with technological things or in your hands. I actually did get a good cast of a tire track in a killing in Fayette County one time. I was so proud of myself because I, I put the little sticks in there, you know, to hold it together mm -hmm. and did the plaster of Paris thing and all that, and it looked good. Put it in the back of the chief deputy's car in a floorboard back seat. 
and somebody threw a can in it or something and broke it. Oh. And I, I almost cried. I know. I know. It makes you sick. Because I couldn't, sick. first of all, I couldn't believe it. I'd been able to do it, you know. But, uh, We've you know. casted with uh, dental stone. That's, that's actually a good, because it, it. what now? It, dental stone. It's the same thing oh. that dentists make um, teeth impressions out of. Like if a kid's getting braces or dent, you know, somebody's getting dentures or something like that. It's the same material that they use. And it sets up really, really hard. And it sets up faster than the, the plaster of Paris. And there's a um, an evidence company, and I'm not sure who it is. I can't think of which one. I'd be able to find it if I searched for it. But they sell a product that is similar, but they sell it prepackaged in little uh, plastic Ziploc bags, and they send you a cup that's the perfect measurement to pour into that plastic bag with your casting material, and you pour the water in and you mash it up, it has these little blue crystals in it and as soon as all the blue crystals are gone and it's um, the right consistency you're ready to pour so you can just do it right there on the scene super easy you can carry it around with you it doesn't deteriorate you know it's not like since it's in those Ziploc bags and sealed so well it's not like it's going to bring in moisture and ruin in your work truck or anything like right. that you know, right that's good a lot easier to use these days than your plaster well, you know i think one of the to me the, the when you're talking about the advances in, in technology and, and how much help they are the the databases that you were talking about earlier that can give you a suspect and you always got a chance somewhere and you know well you can you work some before that i think when you start out and you you've got to have let's say fingerprints if they're not on file you're out of luck right and, and half the time, I know in the situations that I was in, a lot of the prints that got sent in got sent back because they weren't good enough to classify. Mm -hmm. And those prints never, by and large, they never got taken again because that person had made bond and they were gone. So you didn't, they didn't even get in the system. It's the ones on an arrest card were right. getting sent back because they weren't, yeah. Right, because mm -hmm. they weren't good enough to, to classify. So then even if you get that person's print from a crime scene and it's good enough to make an identification on the crime scene print, you don't have anything to compare it to. You don't, because, know, who, you don't know who to compare it to. Because the arrest card got kicked back. Well, right, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, that's yeah. one of the things I think about now. Uh, you know, like in, 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 the, in the, the, the King assassination that, that I'm writing the book on that, that you so graciously hit me with <laughs> so much, and I appreciate that. You don't know how much I appreciate it. But uh, they they were, had a bunch of fingerprints, and they didn't have an automated system to compare those prints to. And I read two different figures. I read one thing said they went through 400 uh, sets of cards before they got a hit, and one says 700. Wow. And I would say they were fortunate with either one. But I would, you know, if, if you and I were trying to do that, we'd be able to to probably get a, some kind of profile to narrow down the number of prints we wanted to look at, at least to start with, wouldn't you think? Right, and they did too back then. Um, so the fingerprint cards um, that were stored at the FBI are stored by classification. So it's it's an overall classification. If, if you knew that your uh, print from your crime scene was a loop, and it was a left slant loop. You got loops, whirls, and arches, and then Which you have th those are little little markings on your finger, right? That's correct. Yeah, okay. the, the ridge detail on your fingers. Okay. And those are the the three main ones, and then there's subsets. But loops, whirls, and arches. So if you have, if you know that you have a left slant loop, you would go to that portion, and, and it had, and there's 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 more than just that. But anyway, there's a ridge count and things like that. That is how they're classified. But a uh, latent examiner then would go to that card file and start pulling left slant loops with that same ridge count and just comparing card after card after card to the crime scene print. Um, and then you could narrow it down further than that. Right. Because some of those are going to be dead. Mm -hmm. Some of them are going to be locked up. So you could... And see our database now, uh, NGI, Next Generation Index, which is the FBI system, um, it's an automated fingerprint identification system. You can, and I've never really used this feature, but I can see where it would be super beneficial if, if I had enough information. Let's say, Leach, you went out and you worked a bank robbery and you saw the suspect on video 
and you knew it was a white male and when they were driving out of the parking lot you could see on the camera from outside that they had a Mississippi license plate on their car you bring me a fingerprint from the teller's counter where you could see on video that that suspect touched that area right I could take that fingerprint scan it in say that it was a right slant loop or left slant loop and I could even get as specific as to tell the system only look for for right slant loops only look for white males only look in the state of Mississippi and Tennessee and it's gonna just it's going to narrow my field down so much that my results are going to come back in lightning speed so now, now instead you're saying of I could do I mean do you do, do you literally mean you could do it can you do it do you have the equipment to do that oh here? yes we do yes at, right? at Jackson Place Department yes wow. we do mm-hmm. huh. yeah wow that's good that's good stuff it's all, it, well we're about to the end here but it's I always enjoy I always hate to see it in because you're always so listening fascinating uh, we got a couple of minutes anything you'd like to leave folks with um i always want to stress that you know if anybody knows anything please call crime stoppers you know you may know something that someone said about an unsolved homicide or any other crime and you may think that that's it's fake information or the person's just boasting or it's not true but you may hold that one little bit of information that you know the officer or the investigator is waiting on to actually seal their case so um you know i just encourage anybody to to call and report those things you can report them anonymously to to mike johnson at crime stoppers i'm sure you know the number i don't know the number off the top of my I head but <laughs> mike johnson yeah, everybody knows mike everybody johnson. knows mike johnson i hate <laughs> to say anything good about mike johnson but but it really does we got one of the premier programs in the nation yeah he's so, won he's won several awards for yeah, his he has, yeah. but uh, yeah and you know I, I can't tell you how many times i've been talking to people and they say well this probably doesn't mean anything Mm-hmm. And it turns out it, when they tell it to me, because, you know, I may know things about this case that they don't know. Right. And it did mean something. I've, I've had that happen more, you know, many more than one time. Uh, and that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Sometimes you just look for that one little needle in the haystack, and that makes everything. And it can so. come from very unusual places. Mm-hmm. Very unusual. Good comment. Good comment. I appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy you are. I mean, I appreciate you spending Thanks time for having me. Time. Folks, that's going to wrap it up for us today on Investigator. Uh, my name's Jim Leach. You can find my books at Books by Leach, L-E-A-C-H, booksbyleach.com, or you can go to Amazon. i got my own uh, author's page there. And Amy's helping me work on a book right now about the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And once again, I appreciate her help so much. She's a fountain of information. Uh, come back and be with us again next week. And uh, please be aware of your surroundings. Be safe. If you see something that doesn't look right, stay away from it. See you in church. Thanks.